world's flying high. You know how. Good afternoon. I'm Gary Garland, Executive Director here at Wisconsin Parkinson Association, and I have the great pleasure to welcome you to day three of our week long um, recently diagnosed webinar series. I hope you've had the chance to join us for days one and two, um, and I hope you found those to be uh, beneficial um, for you and uh, continue to join us for the, the today and the, the rest of the week. Because so many of you are new in the audience, I want to take uh, just a couple minutes and uh, let you know a little bit about, uh, inform you about the work that WPA does um, and what we truly believe um, will offer you great resources in your Parkinson's journey. Yeah. In a nutshell, uh, Wisconsin Parkinson Association uh, really focuses on helping you live a healthy and as fully as possible today. That's what we're focused on today. And our mission is to provide um, hope, community, resources, um, and, and support for people both with Parkinson's um, and those who love them. So today I want to take just one of those words from our mission statement. Um, and that word is hope and tell you a little bit about how we um, attempt to carry uh, that to you each and every day. Of course, the, the, the greatest hope for the Parkinson's community um, is to find a cure. And, and while WPA's mission is focused um, on your quality of life today, uh, we, we do work in partnership with uh, groups that are focused on, on research, groups like the Michael J. Fox Foundation. Um, so we lend our name and our efforts to their work. They reach out to both governmental agencies and non-governmental agencies to ensure that great research is happening. We all look forward to the day when this disease is a memory. But there's, there's certainly reason for hope today and w, WPA brings you uh, that each and every day. Um, the research is clear. Exercise undoubtedly offers um, hope for better physical and mental health outcomes for those with Parkinson's. And that's why WPA hosts eight exercise, uh, Parkinson's specific exercise classes all around the state of Wisconsin. Um, and we do those in person when it's safe to, to do so. Um, but for the last year, we've been hosting online um, classes and held over 100 of those exercise classes um, uh, for you. Hopefully you've participated in that. Um, timely and accurate information can certainly also be a source of, of great hope. Through presentations like today, through our publications and our videos, um, you're going to learn about the latest medical and non-medical treatments available to you. So, um, and as you come to our in-person programs, you can have rare access and talk face-to-face -face both to, to uh, medical uh, health providers and providers of various treatments um, uh, for Parkinson's. Um, and it's our intention that that information offers you the opportunity for the health the healthiest today. So partnering with research focus groups while bringing you dynamic exercise options and access to information from um, the best minds on Parkinson's and its management um, is how WPA brings hope to you today. As we get started, I wanna thank our sponsors who make this webinar series possible, Medtronic, Amneal, Boston Scientific, and Kiwa Kieran. Just a note, you are muted. We cannot hear you or see you, but if you want uh, to ask a question for our speaker today, just use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen, type in your question, submit it. We're gonna to get to as many of those um, questions as possible at the end of today's presentation. And if we don't get to them today, um, watch our publications and our uh, future programs where we'll try to answer those. Today, we're going to hear from Dr. Katie Spangler from Marshfield Clinic. Dr. Spangler sees patients in Wausau and Weston and Manaqua, and she treats the majority of her patients um, have Parkinson's. We're proud to say that she's a member of our medical advisory committee. Uh, today, Dr. Spangler is going to cover some of the non-motor symptoms of Parkinson's. Welcome, Dr. Spangler. Good morning, thank you for having me. Actually, I should say good afternoon, right? 
All right. So let me share my screen here. All right. So Parkinson disease, it isn't just a movement disorder. I know earlier in the week, if, if those of you were involved in um, the, the other presentations, they talked a little bit more about the motor symptoms and how to treat them. Uh, so today I'm gonna talk primarily about the non-motor symptoms. Um, I can't not talk a little bit about the history, however, of Parkinson. This is a very Dr. busy- Spangler, we can't see your screen. Okay. <laughs> Let's try that again. Um, there it is. There it is. That will be more helpful. Perfect, thank you. Here we go. Now we can? All right. Yep, looks great. Okay. All right, so you heard what I said, but you didn't see what I said. So basically, um, I'm gonna go over the history, just a little bit of Parkinson's. Um, this is a very busy slide, but basically it just gives you a little rundown that we've known about this disease for uh, you know hundreds of years. Um, and I just wanna bring your attention to as things kind of, uh, so carbidopa levodopa uh, was available and really was a, um, a pretty big landmark for treatment of Parkinson's disease in um, the early 1960s. Um, but then as things, sorry, as things uh, have developed, uh, we then went to what we call adjunctive medications, which I know they talked a little bit about earlier this week. Uh, DBS um, hopefully was mentioned as well. And then as we're kind of going down, um, even very recently, I would say, you know, in the last five to six years, there's many other medications that have been, uh, that have come to market for motor symptoms of Parkinson's. And of course, we've also been able to develop new DBS systems as well. So I just wanted to throw this slide out there. It's kind of fun to look at, to see that over hundreds of years, how things have, have developed and continue to develop. Um, okay. So motor symptoms, um, most of you probably have heard some of these before. I'm gonna breeze through this a little bit. Basically, we talked about the four motor symptoms of Parkinson's. We talk about resting tremor, uh, stiffness, fancy term, rigidity, slowness, uh, bradykinesia, and then that gait or balance. Um, we monitor these motor symptoms um, in clinic through a scale that we use. It's a numeric scale that puts a number to the severity of these four motor symptoms. And that scale is called the UPDRS, which is called the Unified Parkinson Disease Rating Scale. So those four motor features again, again, hopefully you've heard about some of these earlier this week, but tremor is gonna be any rhythmic shaking of a body part. It can actually involve any body part. It typically we think about in the hands, but it could be an arm, a leg, even the face, the head, the chin. It usually starts on one side. It will eventually affect the other side, but it will always stay worse on the side that it started on. It starts out with a tremor at rest. So when your hand or your brain is interpreting your um, body part at rest, it will, um, that's when the tremor comes. Um, but when you're trying to do something with your hand, you won't notice it as much. Sometimes it starts out intermittently and it will be worse with many different things as listed there. Rigidity is that muscle stiffness. Um, it's not a bone stiffness like arthritis. This is something we measure in clinic with that scale. Uh, patients also though can feel just stiffness and sometimes it's hard to sort out. Is it bone stiffness or muscle stiffness? And that just uh, takes talking with your provider to try to sort that out. That as well can affect any part of the body. Bradykinesia. So again, this means slowness of movement. Um, we test this in clinic. You may have seen us. We finger tap. We open and close our hands. We have you turn. And then, of course, in the lower extremities, we have you do different tasks as well. And then that fourth symptom is gait and balance. Um, often people with idiopathic Parkinson disease, posture is a little stooped. You can have decrease in arm swing, 
Uh, usually later in the disease, people will have what we call freezing of gait, which is just basically where your feet are kind of stuck to the floor. They don't want to move. Um, you can shuffle. We test this in the clinic primarily by what we call the pull test, where we stand behind you and pull you back. So as well as those motor symptoms, there's other symptoms uh, that we think about just kind of listed here that we can see. Trouble getting out of bed, excess saliva, such as drooling, soft voice. This is an example of micrographia, as you can see on the top. This is before levodopa was given and then after levodopa was given. So that's that micrographia just means smaller handwriting, and it's often may start out large and then get smaller the more you write. I just have some videos here. We're not going to watch all of them. I didn't want to take that time. Oh, hopefully they work. <laughs> Um, so this is a patient who uh, basically, you can see that masked face, decreased blink. Um, see a little bit of postural tremor there. This is how we monitor the tremor. This is again that UPDRS, looking for that bradykinesia, slowness of movement. And again, these are what we call the motor symptoms. So again, looking at bradykinesia in the lower extremities. This is freezing of gait. So this is, uh, this is basically where the feet are kind of stuck uh, to the ground. And there's very much, people can have freezing of gait in different scenarios. I call it situational. So doorways is a big one, as you can experience here by watching her. She also has a freezing of gait in turning here. So she gets kind of stuck there. And then this is the same patient with levodopa now. So look at her face. So just the difference, she blinks, she's more animated. So just with treatment, how much those motor symptoms can improve. Oop. Oh, sorry, let me, this is pretty dramatic, I think. There she goes. So I like showing this video just to see how well people can respond to the carbidopa levodopa. So she didn't have tons of tremor, but this is just more classic uh, for tremor, that one-sided, again, asymmetric tremor. Again, unilateral, a little bit of mass spaces there, decreased blink. Okay. All right, so that's enough about motor symptoms. What about non-motor symptoms? So in Parkinson disease, we do see a lot of other symptoms um, that maybe is higher in the general population or higher, I'm sorry, that, that we see in people with Parkinson's disease. Um, and I have them kind of listed there, but in general, and we'll go over these in more detail. Uh, so what are the non-motor symptoms of Parkinson's disease? So we covered the motor symptoms, and I like to say that those are primarily dopamine related. Uh, non-motor symptoms can be relate, uh, regulated by different types of chemicals in the brain, and we'll go over that a little bit. Um, so what are these non-motor symptoms in Parkinson's? Uh, we have what's called sleep problems, and I'll go over what, what do those mean. We also have autonomic problems, uh, problems with the bladder, bowel, sweating, saliva, sexual dysfunction, and even drops in blood pressure, that orthostatic hypotension. Autonomic problems are pretty much, um, it's a part of the nervous system that basically regulates those body parts. And so there's a dysfunction in that part of the nervous system. Patients with Parkinson's also can have cognition or thinking problems, mood as well. The percentages there, I, I truly believe to be higher, <laughs> I feel in my practice, but um, mood as well, up to 50%, I would probably even say two thirds. Some patients with Parkinson's can have sensory symptoms or frank pain as part of their non-motor. Fatigue is a big one. Psychosis, hallucinations, or what we call impulse control disorders, punding, which we'll touch on. And then we also categorize that decrease in sense of smell and taste as one of those non-motor symptoms. So why do people with Parkinson's have non-motor symptoms? Well, we actually think there's a pathological 
uh, reason behind it. So they're actually, and hopefully you've learned this earlier in the week, that there actually is deposition of some of these proteins and production of Lewy bodies outside of that substantia nigra in the basal ganglia. So we believe that those proteins um, in the basal ganglia, the substantia nigra specifically, pars compacta, is what gives you the motor symptoms. But it's when these proteins uh, distribute in, um, in different parts of the brain uh, in terms of why they, you get those non-motor symptoms. So we've seen these, these proteins in cells in the olfactory bulbs, which is uh, basically the nose. Um, we also have seen them in the GI tract. And there's some recent evidence coming out that perhaps this may be one of the first sites uh, that, that they're uh, found. Um, we call it kind of a prodrome Parkinson's. Um, we also have seen these deposited in the salivary glands, sweat glands, even in the back of the retina or back of the eye in the retina, um, perhaps also in the spinal cord or at least in that autonomic nervous system, which is part of, of offsets of the spinal cord. And then we've also seen them in different parts of the brain. Different parts of the brain include limbic system, prefrontal cortex, hippocampus, amygdala, big fancy terms, but basically those are areas involved in um, impulsivity, in mood, in planning, initiating some memory issues um, and um, emotion. So as I alluded to earlier, um, so there are other transmitters involved in uh, Parkinson's other than just the dopamine, which is again, why we think that um, some, some, of, some of these non-motor symptoms are there. We do know that dopamine loss by itself will actually affect other pathways. So we know that they affect actually serotonin, acetylcholine, and then norepinephrine. So we think that the dopamine, that's, that's where it starts, but then because of what happens there, it kind of affects these other pathways and then other parts of the brain. So this is a, a fun picture basically, just showing uh, you know, that Parkinson's isn't just involving the substantia nigra pars compacta, but that it, it can affect other parts of the brain, which of course lead to what some of these non-motor symptoms. Talked a little bit about this, but we think that there might be an element of what we call preclinical Parkinson's disease again. And this is just based upon the fact that we diagnose Parkinson's disease with the onset of those motor symptoms I mentioned. But sometimes preclinical Parkinson's can be predated by different symptoms, including REM behavior disorder, which if you've heard of that, basically it's acting out dreams. Um, in, park, in people with Parkinson's disease, uh, so I should say people without Parkinson's disease, we are paralyzed in our REM sleep, except our eyes. And it's, REM is also our dream state. So it's where we do uh, our dreaming primarily. And, uh, but in people with Parkinson's disease, they aren't paralyzed. So they end up acting out their dreams sometimes. And this is typically in the early morning hours. Um, but this can, these can sometimes predate, these preclinical symptoms can sometimes predate the onset of these motor symptoms by 10 years. I have even seen some reports even out to 15, 17 years. So of course, I always wanna let people know that these things in general are much more common in the general population. And so just if you have REM behavior disorder or constipation or anxiety, doesn't mean that you're definitely getting Parkinson's disease. Um, and then, so I just wanted, this slide was mainly uh, to bring out that. This is just another way to kind of show that, sorry. Um, again, these non-motor symptoms often predate some of these motor symptoms and then therefore the diagnosis of Parkinson's disease. And they can predate, um, like I mentioned, even years up to a decade before. So why do we even care about these non-motor symptoms? Well, there's a good study, uh, actually was through the Michael J. Fox Foundation who reported it, but basically as you can see here, so these are all non-motor symptoms, okay? And this was the incidence that they found in this study of patients with Parkinson's who had these non-motor symptoms. So you can see fatigue was, uh, was a big thing and then obviously the lower we go this way. But the yellow, I want you to, 
I apologize, my computer is very sensitive. Um, I want to I want to bring your attention to the yellow and the blue. So the yellow is found to be the most impactful, actually. So as you note, um, mo non-motor symptoms actually can have a larger impact on the quality of life than the motor symptoms themselves. So that is why we've started to look more at these non-motor symptoms, not only in recognizing them, but also trying to find adequate treatment for them because it definitely can affect quality of life and in some patients even more than the motor symptoms. So what are some of these motor symptoms? Um, well, basically, um, so I mentioned the sleep earlier. So in general, there's all sorts of different uh, sleep issues that we that we see as part of Parkinson's, um, REM behavior disorder. I talked a little bit about restless leg syndrome, and I and I lumped it with the periodic limb movements of sleep. I could I could I'll be honest. I could probably give a whole entire lecture on each of these non motor symptoms. So it, it's just a lot of ground to cover. So I'm only going to cover briefly what we can uh, with the time restraint. Um, but basically, reg, restless leg syndrome is is the urge to move the legs. It's usually in the evening hours. It can affect going to sleep at night. Periodic limb movements of sleep are actually jerks in the middle of of sleep, so you're actually sleeping during those. You also can have excessive daytime sleepiness, uh, sleep fragmentation, which is just basically our brains are, a normal brain, I should say, a normal sleep brain should go from um, REM, REM to first stage, second, third, and fourth. And we should do that throughout the night. Um, our deep sleep is less in the morning, but in patients with Parkinson's, we don't necessarily where our sleep is fragmented, our brain does not follow that normal um, sleep pattern. And we kind of jump between stages and we have more arousals or micro arousals. So our sleep perhaps is not very quality, what I would say. Um, what about those autonomic um, dysfunctions? So uh, basically, Again, autonomic is a part of the nervous system that is, is involved in bladder function, bowel, bowel function, uh, saliva, um, sweating. And so you can have problems with the autonomic nervous system as part of the non-motor symptoms. Um, I wanna raise attention here to one of this orthostatic hypotension. Basically what that is, is a drop in blood pressure upon position changes. So going from sitting, I'm sorry, from lying to sitting, sitting to standing, you can have drops in blood pressure. And some patients would experience dizziness or lightheadedness with that, but not necessarily. Some people actually, their legs just get kind of heavy uh, and they feel kind of uh, like their legs are noodles and then they can lead to falls. So it can manifest itself a little differently. So in addition to those non-motor symptoms, we also have cognition and mood. So we sometimes lump them together into the neuropsychiatric symptoms. And we, we do that only because it, the, these are these specific cognitive and mood symptoms are thought to be related to more of what we call a low dopamine state. So you've probably learned earlier this this week that that when you're on carbidopa levodopa for a period of time, um, you can develop what we call motor fluctuations. So basically, um, you kick in, you wear off, you kick in and wear off. And in the low dopamine states, you actually could have changes in your non-motor symptoms, uh, such as cognition or mood. So as you, as you see there, so in your off states or when you're low with your dopamine, you can actually have Slow, slower processing speed, more problems with executive functioning, attention and concentration. You also may feel anxious or depressed. And again, that can be uh, present um, with fluctuations with your motor symptoms. You also, however, can have psychosis or neuropsychiatric symptoms when you're high in terms of your high dopamine state. So when you're kicked in and perhaps you're dyskinetic from a motor perspective, you may have some non-motor symptoms that are problematic and associated with that high state. These um, are hallucinations, um, illusions. So what are the difference? Illusions is basically that your brain interprets something in the environment that's actually there, but it 
I'm sorry, but it misinterprets it. So there actually is something on the wall, but your brain thinks it's something else. Versus hallucinations is something that your brain makes up on its own. It actually is not exist, uh, but your brain either sees it or hears it. Impulse control. So this is something uh, that that some of these medications can cause, such as uh, gambling, sexual preoccupation, um, impulsive shopping, um, those types of things that we hear about. Punding is something um, that I think is a little underrecognized, but basically it's a it's a very repetitive behavior. So. Um, things that um, you will do over and over and over again. And it's quite debilitating. It'll keep you from going to the dinner table to eat or otherwise doing activities of daily living. You can also even become almost manic um, where you don't sleep, you don't wanna eat, you're kind of on a high because of this dopamine. Dopamine dysregulation is a term that we kind of use for some of these behaviors, but it's also because patients who this, this high dopamine state actually usually feels very good to somebody. Um, and so they just want more of their dopamine. And we just kind of call that dopamine dysregulation. So the, the thought about hallucinations or illusions, um, you know, is it really Parkinson disease itself or is it part of the medication? I, I truly believe it's usually a little bit of both. And most patients, I know a lot that are in on this, um, this webinar are newly diagnosed. So I, by all means, I don't wanna get people nervous or scared about these. These are usually in more advanced patients. And although some commercials out there say that about 50% will experience hallucinations or illusions, I don't find that to be the case clinically, at least in my practice. It's just something we watch for because uh, obviously they can cause problems if they do happen. I just wanna always bring up that if somebody all of a sudden doesn't have hallucinations or illusions, but all of a sudden they do, um, we really have to look for something else. Um, I usually do that first. So if somebody comes to, to, to my clinic or calls us and says, you know, I, I'm now seeing children or bugs or animals in my, in my place and I've never seen them before, I immediately will get labs or urine just to double check that there isn't a concomitant infection somewhere um, and kind of tipping, tipping the brain over for those symptoms. What are some other non-motor symptoms? Well, uh, basically pain, so I mentioned it, and the pain is, is more of a what we call a, a central pain. So it's coming from the brain itself. It's not a focal joint pain. So it's Parkinson's disease itself is not gonna cause a knee pain, an ankle pain, a hip pain. It's gonna be a pain of a leg or just pain, a diffuse pain, so all over. Um, it can, be, it can be focal, especially if you have what we call dystonia. And dystonia is one of those um, symptoms where it can't, a motor symptom that can be either in the on or the off state. And so when your meds are kicked in, you may be dyskinetic and have part of dystonia. Dystonia by definition is just, um, it is contraction um, of muscles to cause kind of a twisting posture. Commonly we see dystonia in the feet. Um, so again, though, you can see it in the on state or the off state. Um, fatigue is a big one. I'm going to focus on that. Um, you know, it's at least in 60% of patients. I find it probably is, is higher. Um, it's probably multifactorial, um, but we've also seen that it could be related to the motor fluctuations specifically. So somebody went over this earlier this week. Um, but as you see here, so motor treatment is really focused on that dopamine. How can we get your brain more dopamine? And it's through these different mechanisms, well, whether it's carbidopa, levodopa, um, some of these, what we call agonists, adjuncts, and then some of the other ones over here. Uh, they talked about this, I think, earlier in the week, so I'm not going to belabor this too much, but just know that there are a lot of other medications out there for the motor symptoms. So we used to think that treatment of motor symptoms would have no effect on the non-motor symptoms, but do they? I talked a little bit earlier that I think in some cases, your non-motor symptoms may be more pronounced if your motor symptoms are not controlled. So talked about this, but basically when you start on carbidopa levodopa treatment, um, as you go through time, you will develop these more fluctuations of symptom control, motor symptom control. And you may develop on 
in your on state, dyskinesia, or you're off. So again, these are the motor fluctuations that, that people develop over time. I usually uh, tell people out of a good study several years ago that about 30% of patients will develop motor fluctuations after three years, about 50% at five years, and about 80% at 10 years. Just another way to look at this, but basically you take your medicine, you kick in, but then you wear off and you kick in and then you wear off. So what we're starting to see is not only could you have motor fluctuations, but you can have non-motor fluctuations that coincide with that. So what do I mean? Well, basically, just as I said, we have learned that just like motor symptoms can fluctuate, so can non-motor symptoms. So sometimes in those high dopamine states, like I mentioned, you can have different symptoms. And again, looking at different parts of the brain are getting activated. So you may almost have some manic type, um, uh, manic type behaviors, sorry, uh, disinhibition, impulsivity, hyperactive. This is where sometimes patients may have those delusions or hallucinations. However, when you're off, you also may have, uh, you may not feel good overall. You just may be apathetic, maybe feel a little depressed. Some patients actually have frank panic attacks in their off state. You also may have some cognitive, what we call verbal fluency. So again, slowed processing speed. You may not be able to think as clearly when, when you're off. Another way to look at this, this is a very, a very busy slide, but um, I highlighted, so a lot of these neuropsychiatric symptoms um, can occur in the off state. I apologize, um, except some of these elevated mood can occur more in the on state. So be mindful of that. What about those autonomic nervous system uh, non-motor symptoms? Well, we do see those as well. Again, more in the off state than the on state. And then sensory, diffuse pain or dysthesia, which just means um, abnormal sensation. Akathisia is a restlessness. So again, you can have some of those more in the off state as well. All right, so let's see. So this slide here just basically shows that um, we've looked at some of these non-motor symptoms. So again, typically, so some of these motor some of these non-motor symptoms definitely fluctuate with motor symptoms. So if patients are having some non-motor symptoms, our first go-to is going to be, well, how do they correlate with the timing of your Parkinson medications? Is it when, do they happen when you're on or when you're off, or is there no fluctuation? And we're obviously going to try to treat the non-motor symptoms by first seeing, are they correlated with your motor symptoms? However, sometimes they're not. Um, and so we are looking at specifically, are there treatments um, that specifically can address the non-motor symptoms? Um, up until I would say recently, you know, we've just kind of separated the two. We treat the motor symptoms and we don't expect that treatment of the motor systems with the dopamine is going to affect the non-motor. Well, now we know that's not always the case. Of course, it depends on the non-motor symptom we're talking about, but um, we also now are looking at, well, maybe some of these medicines that we treat the motor symptoms actually could have a role in just treatment of the non-motor symptoms. And so this slide just kind of looks at that, but basically, you know, studying some of these other more advanced treatments of Parkinson's and seeing, do they seem to affect the non-motor symptoms? And you can just see there are different DBS implantation sites, and then um, the pump and uh, the Duopa, you know, have been shown to perhaps add or help with some of these non-motor symptoms as well. So again, treatment of the motor symptoms have a, have a pretty good uh, link with treatment of the neuropsychiatric symptoms, the mood, the cognition, autonomic, and then, um, but what about the sleep? So the sleep we have found that unfortunately, 
sometimes by treating the motor symptoms, you can, you can help with the sleep, but not always. Um, so these are some treatments that we've noted for specifically for sleep. Um, we talk about the new pro patch has been studied and shown to perhaps help with sleep maintenance, what we call. There's also some medicines there listed that is being studied in terms of helping with that REM behavior disorder. These are some treatments that we know also have been studied and shown to be beneficial in terms of some other of sleep non-motor symptoms. So treatment of uh, autonomic symptoms. Um, so here as well, I'm just gonna, I'm not gonna read every slide here, you can read them, but these are typically the treatments that we would give. So the treatment of autonomic symptoms, again, not necessarily, first we're gonna try to control the motor symptoms, but if that doesn't work, then I'm gonna try to look at what are some other treatments out there. I typically don't end up treating um, these with these medications. I usually end up uh, go, sending my patients to a urologist, mainly because if, if bladder urgency and frequency is becoming an issue, I always wanna make sure that diagnostics are performed and rule out any other causes other than just Parkinson's for, for these bladder symptoms. Um, bowel and constipation can be an issue. Um, their uh, Miralax um, is something over the counter that you can get. It really has shown with evidence to be the most beneficial for people with Parkinson's. However, other agents obviously have been used as well. Um, Drooling is something um, we look at. So we do try different medications. Um, most movement neurologists also can perform Botox to the salivary glands to help dry up those salivary glands if that's a problem in terms of quality of life for patients. Um, orthostatic hypotension, again, that drop in blood pressure that we talk about. Um, you know, patients, I really want to make sure that you're drinking enough liquid every day. There's different things that you can do um, as well in terms of behavioral modifications, whether, um, you know, I just kind of listed them there. But if those uh, don't work and people are still getting lightheaded or dizzy upon position changes, um, there are medications that are actually approved and used just to help raise the blood pressure. Erectile dysfunction, um, this as well as one of those autonomic non-motor symptoms that can affect people. Um, I typically refer back to primary care for this, again, just to make sure that no other cause for erectile dysfunction is there before we just chalk it up to Parkinson's. So again, how do we treat the mood and apathy? Uh, well, we try to control those motor fluctuations first. Um, and then after that, um, some of these adjuncts of adjunctives actually have been shown to, so these are motor medications, but they have been shown to help reduce uh, depression, again, affecting those fluctuations. Um, uh, exercise and staying active. I'm a big advocate to try to get patients to stay active. Overall, Parkinson patients do better in terms of their mood and motor symptoms um, if they stay both active physically and socially. Apathy, so apathy is different than depression. Um, again, I could speak a whole hour just on the neuropsychiatric symptoms um, of Parkinson's, but apathy is basically um, a lack of motivation. And usually the patient that has apathy is content. They are happy, uh, but it's their care partner or uh, their family members where that apathy kind of drives them crazy. Um, and again, it's a lack of motivation. Apathy technically is separate than depression, but obviously it can be seen with depression as well. Um, those are just some, some treatments there listed in terms of how we treat apathy. Cognition, again, they can fluctuate with our motor control. So we try to control that first. Um, if not, there are medications that we specifically use as what we call cognitive stabilizers, and they're all just listed there. The, uh, the start item here is just this rivastigmine is the one that actually is FDA approved for Parkinson disease memory issues. The others we use quite frequently, but technically they're not FDA approved for Parkinson's. Psychosis. Um, 
and again, I don't, I don't want people thinking that the majority of people end up having psychosis, but it's something that um, needs to be treated and monitored for and recognized. Um, so sometimes it's just, again, I think it's a cause, I think it's a medication plus, plus disease itself. So obviously if it's medication, we're gonna try to pull back a little bit on the meds. We're gonna make sure an infection isn't going on, especially if there's been an abrupt change in development of these. Um, be aware that there actually are medications that can worsen the, symptom, the motor symptoms of Parkinson's, Parkinson's disease. Um, but if we can't get control of the psychosis, um, then we may use medications to help with it. And these medications are just listed here. There is a specific medicine we use that is probably one of those that you've seen advertised, um, that Nuplazid, and that is specific to Parkinson's itself. Pain, unfortunately, I've come across some patients where they've had significant pain as part of their non-motor Parkinson symptoms, and there's no class one evidence of any one pain medicine over the other. Obviously, I try to control motor fluctuations, make sure it's not due to off symptoms, uh, but there are different things, of course, being studied specifically for pain. Uh, we treat the pain with other nerve pain medications, um, but there's just not anything specific uh, that has great evidence to always help. Just real quickly, um, some, some fun things I guess we're learning. So there are different motor subtypes uh, of Parkinson's. So I call them different flavors in my practice. There's a lot of different flavors of Parkinson's. So as most of you uh, with these webinars this week you know, are, are newer to the Parkinson world, just know that, that there's different flavors out there. And I tell patients don't compare your Parkinson's to others unless it's only gonna bring you a positive outlook because everybody is very, very different. There are motor subtypes, uh, which, which are well-established in the movement neurology world, um, but we also are kind of looking at, are there non-motor subtypes and how do they relate to the motor subtypes? Um, so we do know that there's a few uh, motor subtypes out there. Uh, and so here are the three major ones that we know. Uh, some patients are very tremor dominant. Some may come more stiff and slow, and then some present initially with more balance issues. So we think there's different non-motor subtypes, and this is based upon different evidence that we find uh, and measurable in the, in the body itself. Um, we find just different things there, but basically we find that serotonin levels are lower in certain patients with tremor dominant and the stiff and slow subtype. Uh, we do know that, though, that those subtypes also tend to have more higher rates of depression. So we're just starting to be able to understand these different subtypes a little bit better. This is just a pictorial of some of that. Um, just basically that we know that patients that may start with certain motor symptoms probably uh, and may or should may and probably be also subtyped into development of more non-motor symptoms. So we think, for example, more tremor dominant patients, although they have less balance issues and they tend to have a slower progressive course, they may struggle more with depression um, or fatigue. Very busy slide, uh, but basically uh, this is just looking again at some of these non-motor symptoms and then the, the different subtypes that we're seeing and then just some other detailed findings um, that we see. So why should we care about non-motor subtypes? Well, because again, some of these non-motor symptoms can predate the motor symptoms by years. So could early, you know, subtyping of these non-motor symptoms predict the prognosis for patient. Um, of course, if we can correlate the relationship of the non-motor symptom to the motor symptoms, and then we may be able to prognosticate for patients. You know, we may be able to say, this is how your disease is gonna go. Um, and then of course, eventually we would hope that we could develop treatments that would help based on your subtype. So in short, um, I know there was a lot to cover, uh, but basically just want you to know that Parkinson's is not just a movement disorder. We do recognize that there are a lot of non-motor symptoms um, in patients with Parkinson's disease. Um, non-motor symptoms can fluctuate just like motor symptoms, specifically both cognition and mood. 
we know that dopamine is not the only neurotransmitter affected in Parkinson's. We now recognize the non-motor symptoms such that treatments are being developed and studied more than ever to try to help because we know that these non-motor symptoms actually can affect quality of life, sometimes more than the motor symptoms themselves. Subtyping the motor symptoms with the non-motor symptoms may give rise to help with prognosis. And then, as I just mentioned, non-motor symptoms affect quality of life more than non-motor symptoms in some patients, or, I'm sorry, than motor symptoms, which is why it's becoming more of a focus for research. Those are my two daughters. For those of you who know me, I have to put them on my, uh, on my lectures always. So questions? I'm coming in, Dr. Spangor. We're having issues. Sorry. Um, I think I'm doing this right. <laughs> yeah. um, for those who don't know me, I'm Jeremy Adi. I'm the Director of Outreach and Education with Wisconsin Parkinson Association. As a quick reminder, there's a Q&A at the bottom of the screen that you can ask any questions for Dr. Spangler. Uh, but we do have two questions that have come in while you're talking. Um, in addition to being on Zoom, we're also live on Facebook. And we had somebody post on Facebook, Dr. Spangler. Can you... Um, discuss a little more of the problems with voice that are affected after DBS surgery and what that looks like in a person with Parkinson's disease. Um, so specifically voice after DBS surgery? Yeah, that's what it said, voice related to DBS. Okay, because obviously there's voice issues outside of DBS and just with Parkinson's itself. But um, so DBS, so voice, voice can be affected by deep brain stimulation and when we talk about deep brain stimulation, um, there's different targets that we use. So depending on the target depends on the potential for voice issues or speech issues after implantation. Um, so for example, uh, bilateral, so both side uh, VIM or thalamus, thalamus implantations um, can lead to dis, what we call dysarthria or slurred speech um, in a subset of patients. Um, so that is a potential risk factor for bilateral implantation of the thalamus for tremor. Um, when we talk about implantation of DBS in what we call the STN, which is primarily the location that we implant for Parkinson's disease, um, I often like to say that, that DBS, although it's a very, very good treatment for the right patient in terms of motor symptoms, um, it can worsen what I call midline, midline symptoms. So you can as well get um, more uh, dysarthric speech or more slurred speech um, with treatment of DBS. Um, if, if patients are expecting DBS to help with speech problems, so again, that softer speech that we know is a motor symptom of Parkinson's, um, DBS, I don't promise patients that DBS can help with that soft speech. We have a therapy for that, just like we have apps for everything, right? I have an app for that. I have a therapy for that. So there's a, a well-established speech therapy called loud, which can help with the soft voice in Parkinson's disease. So I hope that answered the question. It, it did. And actually the, the individual just posted on Facebook asking, could their voice problems be from DBS? They find that when they turn it off, they actually speak louder and more clearly. Yes. Perfect. Um, somebody did just put a question in the Q&A. Um, you mentioned Lewy bodies and Parkinson's disease. Can you discuss the relationships? I think some people get confused when we hear Lewy body dementia, but we also hear this Lewy bodies and Parkinson's disease. So can you touch on what the relationship between those are? Yep. So uh, Lewy bodies are basically protein deposition in nerve cells, period, okay? But depending on where they are will depend on what symptoms you have. So Lewy bodies in the substantia nigra in the basal ganglia are going to get, be more representative of idiopathic Parkinson's disease and those motor symptoms. But once we start to see Lewy bodies dispersed in what we call more cortical regions or more, you know, up higher regions of the brain, then we're going to see more cognitive issues. And that's where that Lewy body disease kind of name comes from. So it's really the Lewy body is a protein deposition in nerve cells, but depending on where they are, kind of depends on what clinical symptoms you, you may have. 
Thank you. Um, one of the other questions that came in earlier, um, you mentioned REM disorder and REM, REM sleep disorder. Their question was a little more specific. Can you talk about why they maybe cry out in their sleep at the end of the REM cycle and why it maybe causes some of the disturbances that are happening? So, so yeah, so REM sleep, as mentioned, it's our, it's our dream state. And for people with Parkinson's, not everybody, but for a subset of people, they are not paralyzed in their REM sleep. And so they're acting out the dreams. Usually these dreams are in the early morning because every brain has more REM and dreaming as our night goes on. We spend more and more time in REM as the night goes on. So typically between two and 5 a.m., for example, we spend our most time in REM. So that's when these dreams are gonna be happening. The yelling out, again, is because we're not paralyzed or these Parkinson patients were not paralyzed. So, so their voice boxes are working, their arms are working, everything's working. Um, and so that's why they're yelling out. Um, the thing about the dreams, which I don't know, I'll be honest, is typically the dreams that people are acting out are quite uh, physical. So they're usually altercations or ch being chased or something like that. And so that's why I think people are yelling is because it's the content of what they're dreaming about. Thank you. Um, and while you answered that, John came in with a question. I've had double vision since my PD diagnosis. I have prisms in my glasses and lenses, which helped at first, but now I still have double vision all the time. Is this caused by the Parkinson's or is there something else going on? So again, I'm, I always want people, if they develop double vision, to see an eye, an ophthalmologist, an eye doctor, because again, ruling out something else, we don't just want to put it in the Parkinson category wrongly. But so let's say we did that, um, but you're still having double vision. The answer is yes, you can have double vision as part of Parkinson's disease. And how I think of it is that, you know, just like our, our muscles in our arms and our legs may slow down, our eye muscles as well may slow down. So they may not move entirely in sync. So when your eyes move, if one just legs a little bit behind the other, your brain is gonna see that as double. Um, prism glasses, yes, are the treatment. Um, of course, we wanna make sure that motor-wise optimized as well. So perhaps adjusting some of the motor or dopamine medications may help with the double vision. I can't guarantee that. It's usually prism glasses, but yes, it can be linked to Parkinson's. Um, and then one more question just came in from Jan. And Jan, if you're listening, and if I don't do this right, please add to the question. Um, but she put, can brain protein be seen in an MRI or some other way? You talked a little bit about the Lewy body dementias. How do we see those proteins um, in the brain? So we, we don't until uh, autopsy. So they have to be put under a microscope. So MRIs, um, typically for diagnosis of Parkinson's, and I don't know if this was covered earlier in the week, but some people order MRIs and some people don't. So MRIs of a Parkinson brain is typically what I would say normal. It just looks like age-related changes. So there's nothing specific that can be seen on, a, on an MRI that will give you the diagnosis of Parkinson's. We typically get MRIs to rule other things out. Um, Facebook has been very active while we've been talking. I've gotten three questions handed to me, so we'll see how well we can do on some of these. Um, I'll start with the probably the easiest one. Is there an age limit for when DBS is appropriate or for somebody to have a DBS? So, no, not really. I mean, um, the FDA, of course, you know, when it came to to market, I'll just say they, they did put an upper age limit. Um, I believe it's 85. Um, that being said, um, I, I don't, age is not a huge factor for me. I mean, it's a little bit, but it's, it's not, um, you know, it really comes down to is DBS going to be right based on, are you a good candidate? And there's different reasons or ways that we know if you're a good candidate, which I don't know, maybe they talked about earlier in the week. So age by itself, although, you know, we think about it, but it, to me by itself is not an exclusion or inclusion criteria. Um, the next one that came in, any studies on cannabis helping with sleep? Oh, the cannabis. So, okay. Um, okay. I'd have to look, I have, I'll be honest. I haven't looked probably in about six to eight months on the cannabis stuff. Um, cannabis definitely is being studied right now, or CBD is being studied um, 
in a, in a large trial actually through University of Colorado, which is not a surprise there, but, um, and, and I don't know if they're looking at sleep particularly. I know they're looking at the motor symptoms. Um, I think CBD potentially based on the smaller studies that have been done, um, I think it may have a role with sleep or pain. Um, but I think the jury again is still out a little bit on it, so. And, and I would reference people um, next week, all these programs will be posted to our website. Dr. Brennan talked a little bit about some of the um, issues with studies with cannabis right now that um, because it's not legal in all states and it's a controlled drug, some of the studies aren't complete, um, but they are trying and we may probably know more in the future, but we'll see. So I'm gonna totally mangle the medication here um, but somebody asked, discuss mirtazapine as a sleep aid, or is there something better that they should be using? Okay. So mirtazapine actually can be used for many different things. It actually is a, a mood regulator. So it's, it has, it affects both serotonin and what we call norepinephrine in the brain. And um, the reason why though it is used for sleep is because it can have a little bit of a sedative effect and it has a little bit of an anti-anxiety effect. So for patients whose sleep is affected mainly by anxiety, you know, their mind is racing, they just can't shut off their brains, they're worried about things, then mirtazapine would be appropriate for that use. So last question I have for you then, um, when we talk about non-motor symptoms, and my experience talking to people, a lot of people go, I don't know if it's a non-motor symptom or if it's just normal aging. As a physician, what would you tell them to do if they have a question between which it is? Um, is it their Parkinson's disease or is it something else? You know, I, I think always just talk to your provider and, and sometimes they can't come up with an answer right at that time. It's something that we maybe have to monitor or we have to do additional studies to really see is it pertinent. And one of those, you know, I think one of those those things tends to be cognition. You know, people, people will go into a room and forget what they went in there for and you know, they'll bring that up and they'll say, oh, is this part of my Parkinson's, you know, and, and there are certain things that we know are age related. Um, but again, I would just want you to talk to your provider uh, about it and know, you know, do we even have to worry about this? I, I, I often say to my patients, you know, don't, you know, put, you have Parkinson's, but don't let Parkinson's have you. You still need to live your life. Don't overanalyze your symptoms. If you are concerned about something, just talk to your provider about it and work through it with them. They get paid to worry about you. So you don't worry. <laughs> Very well said. Uh, Dr. Spangor, thank you so much for taking time today to do the presentation and talk to everybody. Um, again, this will be online very soon. So thank you. With that, I'm going to introduce Gary Garland, our executive director, to say some closing words. And thank you all. Thank you. Yeah, I want to echo that. Thank you, <clears throat> Dr. Spangler, um, for uh, doing a great job covering the, the non-motor symptoms of Parkinson's disease and, and uh, how important it is because they affect the quality of life, how, uh, how those can be addressed. So great job. Tomorrow, we're going to hear from uh, Dr. Nichelle Rothong from Aurora Healthcare. Um, Dr. Rothong is going to address cognitive changes that accompany um, Parkinson's uh, diagnosis. Um, so join us to learn some tools uh, to help you moving forward as well uh, as address your how to address your concerns with doctors. Just a reminder, the link that you uh, joined with today, that's good for the rest of the week. So just click on that and you'll, you'll be in on Thursday and Friday. Um, but if you have friends or family who are looking to join, they need to go to our website uh, to register. And that's wiparkinson.org. Um, as Jeremy mentioned, these programs are gonna be available uh, next week recorded um, where you can uh, revisit uh, any that you missed. Um, finally, I'd like to close by thanking, again, thanking our sponsors. We couldn't do this without you. Um, those are Medtronic, Amneal, Boston Scientific, and Kiran. Um, on Friday morning, you're going to receive an email with a survey about this program. Please, please, please take the time to, to fill that out. It helps us uh, uh, do even better job of, of uh, meeting your needs in our programming moving forward. But you're also going to get um, some information on these great uh, uh, partners and sponsors of ours. So um, we're very grateful for that support. Uh, appreciate you joining us uh, today and uh, enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Thanks.